Welcome, everybody. We're going to give people a few minutes to trickle in, and then we will get started. We probably will be taking up the whole hour that we have dedicated to this. Um, so thanks for choosing to spend some time with us today. Uh, we can see that some people are trickling in. Uh, we're going to we're gonna wait until, I don't know, let's say 11.02, and then we will actually get started. So we'll give people a chance to, to come in. Um, if you have a question, there is a Q&A feature in Zoom, so please ask your questions through that. Um, most likely, we will wait until the very end to start answering questions, but please feel free to put your questions in there at any time. Hey, Olaf. Uh, and um, there is also the chat, so we'll try to share helpful links in the chat you know, during the webinar and stuff. Um, this is being recorded and the recording will be available to watch at the same link that you used to register for this webinar. So if you want to go back and watch the recording later, or if you want to share the recording later with somebody else, you can just use the same link. So we're going to wait until um, two minutes after the hour to get started. Hello, Justin. Yes. Yes is the answer to your question that you asked, Justin. Uh, um, so I see the number of participants. That number has stopped going up, but we're, we are going to wait until about two minutes after to get started in earnest. Um, any other housekeeping things I forgot to say, Jonas, that you can think of? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Just I'll repeat the housekeeping things one more time. Um, Q&A. There's the Q&A feature in Zoom. If you have a question, please put your question in there. We will most likely uh, wait until the end to answer your questions. We probably will take up the entire hour uh, with content here. Um, this is being recorded. If you want to share the recording or if you want to view the recording later, it's going to be available at the same link that you used to register for the webinar. And um, yeah, I guess with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Jonas, who is going to kick us off. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about the um, easiest attack paths in, in Bloodhound. And um, first, who are we? Um, I guess we can start with you, Andy. Sure. Yeah, my name is Andy Robbins. I'm one of the co-creators of Bloodhound, along with Rohan Berserker and Will Schroeder. And today, my title is Principal Product Architect of Bloodhound, which covers Bloodhound CE and Bloodhound Enterprise. Yeah, and uh, my name is Jonas, and I work as a product architect. Um, in the same team as Andy. So I'm Andy's little helper, uh, basically, um, helping out where I can. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of things that we want to talk about uh, today regarding this this topic here. Um, first, we're gonna start off by, by talking about like, what is this ADCS thing, complex system? Um, and then we're gonna talk about like how we have introduced these uh, ADCS components in, into to Bloodhound. And then we're going to show you some, some demos. It's going to be exciting. And then we will go to talk about like um, how ADCS uh, is implemented in Bloodhound Enterprise as well, before we, we have to thank a lot of, of people that has helped us getting so far. But first, what is ADCS? So as I just said, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex system. So we want to make sure that everybody is on, on the same page before we start to talk about how we have implemented ADCS support in, in Bloodhound. So ADCS stands for Active Directory Certificate Services, and it's Microsoft's implementations of, of a public key infrastructure into the Active Directory umbrella. It is a system used uh, for issuing and managing digital certificates. And in AD, it's located in a container called public key services. 
So you can see in the screenshot, there is a container with that name and there's a bunch of, of objects in there. Now, this uh, container here, it it's, uh, lives in the configuration naming context, which is outside of the default naming context uh, where you have all your users and computers and, and groups. And this naming context here is a, is a forest wide naming context. So that means that you will only have one ADCS implementation per forest. So if you install it in one domain, then you'll have it in the entire forest. So what is a digital certificate? It's a concept that relies on asymmetric uh, cryptography. So that means that there's a public part and, and a, a private part where the, the public part or the public key is what you share with people. And then you have a private key you, you keep for yourself. And then it's, it's typically bound to, to a subject and that could be me, for example. So I could have like a certificate that, that represents me and I could send my public key to Andy. And then if Andy wants to send me an encrypted message, he could use my public key to, to encrypt it. And then he would know that I'm the only one that can, can decrypt it because it can only be done with the, with the private key. Likewise, I can also sign a document with my private key and Andy could use my public key to, to uh, confirm that it was me that signed the, the document. So yeah, a digital certificate can be used for encryption and, and, and signing, but uh, also for authentication, which is why it's, it's very interesting for, for us with the uh, yeah, security um, perspective. So, um, a certificate also holds uh, what is known as a certificate chain. And it is based on the, um, the CAS that has issued this certificate. So every certificate has to be issued by, by someone. Um, so in, in my screenshot, you can also see that there is an issue in there. And that's a certificate authority that will issue the certificate. Now, that certificate authority also holds a certificate. And that certificate has also been issued by someone. And then it creates this, this chain of certificates until it, it reads a root uh, certificate, which is a self-signed certificate. So it's signed by itself, issued by itself. And this chain here is important because whenever you're using a, a digital certificate, it's, it's only practical to use it if the, the place where you're using it, it, it trusts this chain of, of certificate authorities in the digital certificate because anyone can create a, a, a certificate, but it's about like who has actually issued this certificate that really matters. There's a lot of uh, interesting components in, in ADCS, but the, uh, yeah, probably the most important one is the, the root CA. So that's the first thing that will be created when you create an ADCS uh, in an AD environment. The root CA holds this, self-signed certificate with, the, with no issuer. And it exists in this certification authorities container. So you can see on, on the screenshot to the right that I have four root CAs in, in my environment here. And these root CA objects here, they'll have the certificate um, that, that represent the root, root CA. And those certificates will automatically be trusted as root, uh, root CA certificates on all the computers in, in the forest. So you can see in, in the lower screenshot that these four root CAs are trusted as, as root, root CAs on, on this computer here. But you might also notice that there's also other certificates in here. So it's also possible to add certificates locally to the computer without using uh, Active Directory ADCS. The main purpose of having a root CA is to issue enterprise CA certificates. And enterprise CAs is uh, the next thing we want to talk about. It's also known as enrollment services in, in Active Directory. But it is a CA that chain up to uh, a root CA. So typically in a three-tier uh, PKI environment, you will have like a, a root CA, which you can see here on, on, on the diagram to the right. And then we'll have uh, one or more intermediate CAs. And then all of them, you will have like these issuing CAs. And the issuing CAs are the online computers that will actually be the one creating certificates for all the, yeah, 
all the users and computers that, that needs the certificates. The enterprise CAs uh, are both the intermediate and issuing CAs. They will all be stored in this enrollment services container within Active Directory. And they will also automatically be, be trusted on all computers in the environment. Now, if an enterprise CA um, uh, is supposed to create certificates that can be used for authentication, then the enterprise CA needs to be trusted for authentication in the environment. And in Active Directory, there's a, an object that is, is, is made for that purpose. So it's called NT Auth Certificates, but it's also known as the NT Auth Store. And it has a property uh, called uh, CA Certificate, which is a list of enterprise CA certificates which are trusted for NT authentication. So without an enterprise CA with a certificate in, in this property here, you cannot authenticate with a certificate created by the given enterprise CA. This list here is replicated down to domain controllers such that domain controllers can, can know when you're attempting to authenticate whether or not you should be allowed to, to authenticate um, to the system. The next component is cert templates. So if you have played around with uh, any of the ADCS abuse primitives, you have probably um, already figured out that you need a certificate template in order to enroll a, a certificate. And a certificate template is, is simply like a template that can be used to yeah, obtain a certificate and it holds some characteristics of, of the given certificate. For example, like what the certificate can be used for and how for, for how long it will be valid and, and yeah, a lot more. A certificate template needs to be published by an enterprise CA before it can actually be used. The environment can have like yeah, a ton of certificate templates, but it's only when they're published to the enterprise CA that they can actually be used. There's some properties on the certificate templates that uh, we want to talk about. And um, the first one is these enhanced key usage keys. And you can see here, I have a list with five different um, IDs or keys, EQs. And these are the five ones that can allow for authentication for a certificate. So if any of, of these are present in the certificate template and you enroll a certificate, then you can use that certificate for, for authentication, given that the enterprise CA is also trusted for NT authentication. There's also come called some, there was also something called issuance uh, requirements. And um, what, what we see is that like the most popular ones uh, that can be used are the manager approval feature and also this authorized signature. Manager approval means that when you request a certificate, the, the request will end up in a pending state where a manager actually has to log into the enterprise CA and approve that request before you receive the certificate. The authorized signatures is a way that uh, the enterprise CA can control that someone needs to, to sign the request before it's, it it's, uh, is accepted, or you need to have a given signature before you can enroll. The last thing we want to talk about is that there are also some flags on certificate templates that can be quite quite interesting or dangerous. And the worst one is probably the enroll supplies, enrollee supplies subject flag. This flag here means that you can, in the request for a certificate, specify who you are requesting the certificate for without knowing their password. So you can basically just like ask for a, a certificate for maybe for authentication if the certificate template allows it, and then you can specify a, a domain admin user. That's also known as, as escalation one, which is something Andy will talk a lot more about in a minute. Now let's look at the, um, the flow of, of um, enrollment and authentication in a, yeah, in a simplified uh, model I've put up here. So when you're requesting a, a certificate, you are reaching out to an enterprise CA and saying, hey, can you give me a, a certificate? And it needs to be of, of this specific uh, template here. Then the enterprise CA will check, first of all, is this template published to, to the given enterprise CA? 
also has this principal enrollment rights on the certificate template in the security descriptor of this template, has the principal enrollment rights on the enterprise here as well. And of course, if there's like any of these issuance requirements, then it will not immediately give the, the certificate. But if that's not the case, then you receive the certificate. And then you can use that certificate for authentication if it has the EDUs that allows it. And let's say that you want to authenticate with Kerberos, then you will send, um, then you will perform the first step in, in Kerberos, which is to prove your identity. And you can do that with a certificate. And the domain control will then verify the certificate by checking that that it is issued by an enterprise CA that is uh, trusted for NT authentication. And that this cert of, uh, will chain up to a trusted root CA, which is trusted on this domain controller here. And then all the CAs in this certificate chain, they are also trusted on the, the computer, like the DC itself. Of course, the cert also needs to have the EQ that allows for, for authentication. And at last, the certificate has to be valid. So if it's revoked by the enterprise CA, then it will not allow authentication or if it has expired, for example. Good. So now we have like the basics um, for the rest of the, the presentation. And um, the next thing is ADCS components in, in Bloodhound. So we're adding five new um, object types in, in Bloodhound. Four of them uh, we've already talked about, like the root CAs, enterprise CAs, NT all store, and certificate templates. Uh, the last one is AIA CA, which is something that we collect for now, but uh, it's not something we really use yet. So it's it's just there, but um, you'll likely um, yeah add some 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 interesting stuff later for it. In this screenshot here, you can see um, how we map it into the LDAP hierarchy of, of this environment here. And um, yeah, as, as mentioned earlier, this, all these ADCS objects here, they, um, they, live in, they live in the configuration naming context, um, which has been like out of scope for, for Japan collection uh, historically. So Japan had to be expanded to, to collect uh, data from this, this naming context here. But because it's replicated to every DC in, in the forest, we only need to have like access to, to a single DC uh, in order to collect this information. Yeah, and um, if you click on any of these like new node types, they will also have an entity panel, like you know it from the existing node types. And we will try like to, to keep it populated with, with all the information that's relevant for, for you as a security principal. For example, you can see if I click on this certificate template here, you can see that uh, marked with yellow, we have that there are no like authorized signatures required and there is no uh, requirement for manager approval. You can also see that the with, with marked with green, we have this certification or certificate application policies, effective use and enhanced key usage. They all set to the same EQU value. Um, that's because the two properties in, in, in Active Directory holding the EQs of a certificate template, and they're most, most of the time they're set to the same thing, but it's sometimes not the case. So we had to like figure out, okay, so which one is actually the one that, that takes presence and, and is the effective EQ, uh, it turned out it, it, it depended on the schema version and whether or not one of them was set. It was like a bit complicated, so we decided to add um, a new property called effective EQs that holds the EQ that that is actually the effective one. So you don't have to to know about like which one takes a presence right now. Also, to make things more simple for for users of the product, we added this authentication enabled boolean value. You can see see it's set to true, marked with uh, with purple. So you don't have to know which of these EQUs that actually allows for authentication. We will uh, calculate that and, and make the logic to, to just give you a Boolean value so you can see, see immediately whether or not a certificate template allows for authentication. We're going to add 
uh, a ton of new edges um, with, with ADCS. And most of them are going to be this non-traversable uh, edges. Um, here's a list of, of all the non-traversable edges that we're going to add um, at least what we know of right now. And before we dive into them, I, I want to yeah to make sure that everybody is, is aware of what we mean with non-traversable edges. So what is that? It is uh, an edge that, that represents a privilege or a relationship that is not that is not abusable on its own. So it because it's not abusable, it's excluded from, from path finding. So when you search for a path from domain users to domain admins, you'll not see any of these edges here in, in your result. But we use these edges here to construct some of the abusable edges in, in Bloodhound. The most simple example uh, is, is probably uh, how we use get changes and get changes all in order to create this DC sync edge. So both get changes and get changes all are non-traversable edges, and they are used to uh, to generate the DC sync edge, which is a traversable edge. Both get changes and get changes all represent permissions you can have on the domain head object, and if you have both of them then you have the rights to perform a DC sync where you replicate all the, the, the hashes of all the principles in that given domain. So when you search for an attack path, you might see a, a DC sync edge for a given user here, but you might also still want to know like how is it possible for this user? Like why is it possible? So you can, for example, remediate it or report to a client like this user has this permission, it shouldn't have it. So we still have these underlying non-traversable edges in the graph. So you can find them and figure out like how are things linked together. So in this case here, we can see that this user has membership of, of two groups where one of them has get changes and the other one has get changes all. And that is how this principle has the DC sync privilege. Cool. So back to ADCS. So here's a bunch of the, the new node types and uh, some of the new non-traversable uh, edges. And uh, let's start from the right. So in the upper right corner, we have this root CA node icon and it has a root CA for edge to the domain. So that means that every computer in uh, this domain here, they will trust this root CA as, as, as a root CA. Then we have this NT off store for edge that leads down to an NT store, NT off store object, which, uh, which tell us that, that this object here is the one that, that dictates which enterprise CAs um, are trusted for NT authentication in this domain. We then have two enterprise CAs in the middle of the screen, and they both have like an issued signed by edge to the root CA. So that means that there's a certificate chain up to this root CA here, or they are actually issued by this given root CA. They also have a trusted for NT off error down to like the NT off store, meaning that both of them are trusted for NT authentication in this domain. Then we have three certificate templates and they are published by these two enterprise CAs. So that means that you can actually enroll in these certificate templates. We can see that authenticated users has enrollment permissions on the enterprise CAs and domain users has enrollment permissions on the uh, certificate templates. And all that combined means that domain users can enroll certificate temp these three certificate templates. And if these certificate templates allow for authentication, then that will be accepted by the computers in, in this environment. So yeah, you can use that for, for authentication. Each of the edges will, will have an entity panel as well. So you can click on the edge and, and figure out what it actually means. And we'll also have some, some references and, and stuff in there. Yeah, I think uh, it's time for me to throw it over to you, Andy. All right, cool. Great job, Jonas. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. 
Okay, let's see. Let me just make sure. Okay, everything looks kosher. All right. So forgive me for using the ultra wide. Uh, hopefully you can see. Um, if not, I apologize. <laughs> so um, I'm going to demonstrate a few things. And the first thing that I'm going to demonstrate is escalation one. The status of escalation one is that we are very, very, very close to shipping this. Part of the reason that it's uh, taken a while to get to that point is because everything that Jonas just walked through, we needed to study and understand and account for so that when we actually produce uh, attack paths in Bloodhound, that you can actually trust them as a user so that you'll know that they're actually accurate. Um, we don't want to produce false positives. We take it very, very, very seriously that Bloodhound is as trustworthy as possible. And so that requires that requires a lot of work uh, behind the scenes. So uh, the end result of that work, let's take a look at with Escalation 1. So usually I don't do live demos, but this time we are. So if this goes sideways, I'll probably never do a live demo ever again. Um, but in this example, we are we're pen testers. We are using Bloodhound, and we have compromised this user right here called demo user. And we want to know: is there an attack path from demo user to domain admins? So we will uh, select pathfinding in the Bloodhound GUI, and our destination node is going to be domain admins in the same domain, which is escalation five dot local. So we do see that there is an attack path. So the user has admin rights on this, which has a session for this uh, user, which is a domain admin. But what if we don't want to do lateral movement? What if we don't want to go to this computer? Well, let's use the edge filtering uh, feature, which is this little filter icon. And something that will be, uh, well, let me let me get to that point later. But we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna disable the admin to edge. Actually, we'll just go ahead and disable all lateral movement techniques. And then when we hit apply, Bloodhound will rerun that query. And now we have a new path, a new shortest path. So demo user is a member of domain users, which can do ADCS escalation one against the domain. The domain contains the users container, which contains the domain admins group. So that tells us that demo user can do escalation one. Okay, how do we do that? Well. We will click on the edge. And here we can see some of the stuff that Jonas was talking about. So if we do general, it'll tell us what that means. We can see example Windows abuse commands. We can see example Linux um, abuse commands, references, of course. But uh, something that will be new is this composition feature. So what this is going to do is show us all of those detail edges uh, that Jonas was talking about here before. Uh, or what we also call non-traversable edges, the edges that by themselves are not enough, but when combined together in a certain way are enough for an escalation to emerge. So when we click on this, this will then give us the information that we need in order to actually do the attack. So domain users has enroll rights against this template and domain users is effectively a member of authenticated users, which has enroll rights against this CA. The CA, is the same CA that the template is published to. This CA is an enterprise CA for this root CA. And it is also trusted for MT authentication. And uh, so these two paths here show us that this CA is trusted for MT auth by the domain. And it also chains up to a root CA for the domain. So that tells us that certificates issued using this template will be trusted by the domain, and they will be valid for NT authentication. So let's try to actually execute that. And here's where things might go sideways. So in this lab, we are running as the demo user. And if I try to dir the C dollar sign share on a domain controller, we will see that we'll get access denied. So you. By default, you have to be a local admin to be able to do this, a local admin on the remote system. So um, as this user 
in order to do escalation one, we need to know what is the CA that we're going to target for enrollment. And that CA is here. It's, it's this node right here. If we click on this node, we will see that we have the DNS host name of the system hosting that service. So we need this. And we will also see that we have the CA name. And so we need that information as well. So we'll copy and paste that and put it into this command here. So here's the CA name. Uh, and then uh, this CA is actually hosted on the DC, which you should not do. But so this effectively is the FQDN of that system. Um, we also need the name of the template. And so that is here. If we click on the template, we can see that's the name right there. And we also need the name of a target user uh, to target. So there's a couple different ways we could do that. So we could just do like netgroup domain admins slash domain. And the one domain admin is a user called researcher. You can also use Bloodhound to do that, of course, as well. So step one, we'll see if this works, is we will copy this and paste. And paste. Nope. This is why you don't do live demos. Copy, paste. And what we should get is a resulting certificate. Certificate has been issued and it should spit that out for us. There it is. Then we are going to copy and paste the cert and we're gonna put it into a file called cert.pem. And then we're gonna run this command to convert that certificate into PFX format. So I will copy and paste all this into a new file here using uh, Vim, the best text editor of all time. And then the command that we're going to run to convert that into PFX format is here, copy. Paste. And the password we're going to use here is going to be ASDF. Now we need to copy and paste that PFX file from my Mac system to the Windows system. To do that, I'm going to pause screen sharing. And I'm going to open up Finder. I'm going to navigate to the directory that this is. So here. Uh, so, okay, here we go. Uh, webinar uh, preview to PFX copy. Okay. Now I will resume share. So the PFX is on my clipboard and then I'm going to paste it um, over here. I think there might actually be a file there already. So re remove cert.pfx. And then we'll paste the new cert.pfx. There it is. And then we're going to use Rubyus to uh, get a TGT as the researcher user using this certificate. Looks like that worked. And then now when we dir the c dollar sign directory on the domain controller what we should see are the contents of that directory holy cow the demo worked that was great so uh we just escalated to domain admin um we are impersonating that researcher user and uh we can we can dc sync we can get the nt hash of the curb tgt we own the forest at that point uh thanks to escalation one so our intent here is to make the discovery and analysis and execution of these ADCS attack paths as simple as possible for you. And so that's a demo of how we are trying to do that with Escalation 1. Uh, pardon me for a moment as I drink some coffee. So that's Escalation 1. I'm also going to talk about Escalation 5. 
And so this is an internal presentation that I gave uh, regarding Escalation 5. And we're just going to talk through it here. And uh, yeah, so this is Escalation 5. This is also Escalation 5. So is this. And this. And this too. But if we back up a bit, we should probably answer a question, which is, what exactly is Escalation 5? If we go back to the original research paper uh, written by Will, uh, Will Schroeder and Lee Christensen, we can see this statement about Escalation 5. And we are going to hone in on the bottom here. It says, any descendant AD object or container in this container, for example, the cert templates container, CA container, NT uh, auth store object, et cetera. If a low privilege attacker can gain control of any of these, the, attack, the attacker can likely compromise the PKI system. So that's all true. Uh, where these objects exist is uh, here, which is something that Jonas showed you earlier. But if we're going to understand Escalation 5, we really need to first understand Escalation 1. And so we've run through this a couple times already. But just a quick refresher. Escalation one, which we just executed, that emerges when all of the following things are true. There is an existing root CA for the forest. There's an enrollment CA, which is trusted for NT authentication by the, by the forest. This same enrollment CA chains up to the root CA for the forest. There's an existing template published to that enrollment CA. This template doesn't require manager approval, doesn't require authorized signatures if it's version two or above. It allows an enrollee to supply a subject alternative name in the request. And it has an EKU, which allows for authentication in the forest. Then there is a principal that has enroll rights on the template and that same principle has enroll rights on the enrollment CA that the template is published to. So all of these things have to be true in order for escalation one to actually emerge. If we put that into a graph form, if we look at it like this, we can kind of visualize it here where we have all of the LDAP hierarchy or the configuration naming context hierarchy that matters for escalation one. And then we have all the different discrete objects where they exist in that hierarchy and what the requirements are on uh, the template and the relationships between these different objects. But what if one of these things wasn't actually true? What if, for example, what if this template wasn't published to the CA? Or what if the CA wasn't trusted for NT authentication? What if domain users has enroll rights on the template, but the template isn't published to the CA and somebody in the domain users has full control of the CA. What about that? And so the way that we think about Escalation 5 as it relates to control of the LDAP objects is that Escalation 5 is every combination of privileges that enable a principal to create Escalation 1 for themselves. And there are at least this many <laughs> combinations, uh, what is that, seven? There are at least seven combinations where if one of these things is missing, or if two of these things are missing, or if three of these things are missing, control of a particular object means that a principal can create the conditions of escalation one for themselves. This is our uh, test harness that we use to make sure that we are comprehensively covering each of those scenarios. So you can see it gets, it gets pretty complicated. If we hone in on one of those examples right here. So in this scenario, the template is published to the CA. The CA chains up to a root CA for the domain. However, the CA is not trusted for NT authentication. So all of this combined is not enough. 
anybody who can enroll in this template, they're not going to be able to actually do escalation one because the resultant certificates will not be valid for authentication. But if there's a principal that can modify this object and has enroll rights on this template effectively, then they can create the conditions for escalation one for themselves. This is an example of what the cipher statement looks like when we are finding such patterns in the graph database. I'm not going to walk through this, but the point that I want to make is that even though this looks pretty complicated, it's actually very, very, very fast to run on the back end. It takes about 38 milliseconds to run. That speed means that we can run those queries in the background for you to then create the post-processed edges that you would see like, um, like here, for example. We can create these edges for you, for example, effectively instantaneously uh, as soon as the data is collected. And so that's also very important. We don't want you to upload data and then have to wait, you know, two days for a bunch of calculations to happen. We want you to push button, get bacon. We want things to be as seamless, as frictionless as possible for you. And so the end result is that after this calculation is done, anybody, any principal that would have, for example, escalation five scenario C, those edges for escalation five scenario C will be created against the domain. And then the other part of this is we also need to be able to deconstruct and show you the detail about how can Miller, for example, do escalation 5C? What are the what are the component parts that enable that? So the obverse of that is uh, a cipher statement that can look like this. I'm not going to walk through that, but this also runs basically instantaneously. Um, and so uh, what you would see with scenario C, for example, uh, in the actual Bloodhound GUI is you would see something similar to this. And the informational edges that we have, you know, for like, what exactly does this mean? We'll have the information you need so that you don't need to look at this pattern and, and understand all the mechanics yourself of what Jonas has gone through at the start of this webinar. We want you to be able to look at this, read a little bit of helper information and understand exactly what an attacker would have to do in order to uh, actually abuse this. In this scenario, this user has enroll rights on a template, which is published to a CA, which chains up to a root CA for the domain. That CA is not trusted for MT authentication, but the user is a member of a group, which is a member of a group, which has generic all on this container. And so that means that this user can create that trusted for MT auth uh, configuration for themselves and with that missing puzzle piece now in place, they can actually perform escalation one. So uh, that's, um, that's what I have to say about escalation five. Escalation five, we don't really have uh, this uh, in, built into the GUI yet or like a, like a development branch in the GUI yet. So I don't really have a whole lot to show you in the GUI for this, but kind of the point I want to make and, and kind of what I want uh, y'all to come away uh, from the webinar with is seeing some behind the scenes of, you know, the care that we take and how seriously we take uh, creating accurate uh, information in the tool and how seriously we take uh, reducing barriers to discovering these attack paths and being able to, to execute them and, and more importantly, to be uh, be able to remediate them on the defensive side as well. So we take it very, very seriously. And, and we, we put a lot of work into making sure that we're covering every possible uh, combination that we, that we can. So that's what I want to say about Escalation 5. And then uh, we're going to talk about Escalation 9. Escalation 9 is... Very, 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 very cool. Escalation 9 was first described by Oliver Luak in this blog post right here. 
And so I'm going to copy this uh, URL and put it into the chat and say, this goes to everyone, paste. So that blog post describes um, Escalation 9 and Escalation 10, which were first described by Oliver Luak. This is his Twitter uh, URL right there, which I'll also link to you in the chat. So why does Escalation 9 matter? Escalation 9 matters because Escalation 9 allows an attacker to impersonate any principle in the forest. The way it does that is it allows the attacker to extract the NT hash of any user in the forest. And what makes this particularly interesting to me and exciting to me is that at no point does the attacker actually have to manipulate or interact with the target user? I think this is so, so cool. And huge kudos to Oliver for discovering this and disclosing it to Microsoft and, and going through all that work. The emergence of Escalation 9 is not simple. The emergence of Escalation 9 looks like this. So... Uh, some of the same requirements, but then some differences. So the template that is going to be relevant here, it needs to have uh, this value, the CT flag, no security extension flag in the MSPKI enrollment flag attribute on the template. And then also for the certificate name flags, it needs to have um, either subject alt require SPN, subject alt require UPN, or subject alt require DNS. There needs to be a principle that has enroll rights on the template. That principle needs to have enrollment rights on the CA. There also needs to be at least one domain controller in the forest that has a particular, a particular registry key uh, called strong certificate binding enforcement. And the value of this needs to be either zero or one. And then the actual attacker, the principal that's actually performing the attack, it needs to have the ability to modify the principal's user principal name attribute. And the principal we're talking about is the principal that has enroll rights on the template and the CA. The way that we model this um, in Bloodhound is like this. So here's our AD attacker. This is a, a user or, or a group or a computer. And it has generic right on this other principle. And this principle has enroll rights on the template, which has the requirements in place that we mentioned. The template is published to an enterprise CA, which the principle also has enroll, enrollment rights on. And this enterprise CA is able to uh, abuse that weak certificate binding against a domain controller in the forest. And this connection is made based on the registry key that comes from the DC. And this DC is a DC for the domain. And then these edges we've already talked about. The end result of calculating all of this is that the AD principle, which can actually perform escalation nine, will have the pathfinding edge, similar to what you see here with escalation one, it will actually have that edge connecting it directly to the domain. And then when you wanna see the detail about how that actually emerges, that will look something like this, what we see here. So here, user one has generic right against user two. User two can enroll on the template which has particular properties. The template is published against the CA. User two also has enrollment rights against that CA. The CA is, uh, it chains up to a root CA, is trusted for anti-authentication, and it uh, is able to abuse this weak certificate binding uh, against this particular domain controller because of a registry key value on this DC. And this DC is a DC for the domain. So this attack, I do want to show you how an attacker can execute. Um, so 
uh, we're going to use uh, all of our Luax tool, Certify, for this. And let's see what we have here. Okay. So we are starting off as user one. User one can perform Escalation 9 against the domain. The way it does that is it has generic right against user two. So we're going to follow the steps that Oliver laid out in his blog post. First, we're going to perform the shadow credential attack against user two. And doing this will uh, let us see the current NT hash for user two, which is here. Then um, we're going to update the user principal name value on user two so that the user principal name is DA. And we are doing that because um, that DA uh, string is the same account name of a domain admin. So we will do that. Andy, um, yeah. there's one person asking if you can increase the font size. I don't know if it's possible to zoom in in any of the uh, of the windows. Yeah. Um. So I'm using the Windows terminal for the first time. It's gotta have like. Oh, you get text, right? You, get, you can get a custom color, but you can't zoom. That's There's awesome. gotta be a way to do it, right? Oh my god! No, we have time. We can we can look at this. So, the number of oh my god, dude! Appearance. There's there's like a bunch of comments that says like Control Plus. Um, okay, we can try that. Plus scroll. Okay, we can try that. I'm I'm on, I'm. RDP'd into a Windows machine using a Mac OS machine. So we'll see if I can find the right combination of key presses. Oh, God. Well, it got well, larger. That did something. Okay, well, we'll just go with this. <laughs> yeah. This is going to move, I think, when I move my mouse. So I think we just got like about 20 uh, questions, like all suggestions about how, how you should zoom. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you everybody oh, yeah. for those suggestions. If if this is good enough for now, we'll we'll stick with this. Yeah, I think that's good. This is also really laggy for me right now, but we'll be, we'll we'll grin and bear. Okay. So we just updated the user principal name attribute on user two. Now we are going to enroll into the escalation nine template as user two. And we're gonna use oh god. <laughs> we're gonna use Oh my God. All right. I, I'm going to have to like, I'm going to have to undo this temporarily at least if I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're just going to have to go with this, how it is. And I apologize for that. We will put out a blog post that includes legible screenshots, videos. Please accept my apologies. So we are enrolling into the Escalation 9 template as user two using the NT hash for user two to authenticate as user two. And uh, this is going to create a PFX for us. And uh, this is actually gonna let us um, authenticate as the DA user. Um, so then we need to uh, change back the UPN value for user two or, or just change it to something else that's not DA. So that's done. Now, uh, we will run this command. And the end result of this command is going to be the NT hash for the DA user. And there it is. So I think this attack is really cool. Huge kudos to Oliver for, um, uh, for his description about this, for his blog post, for his work, for his tooling on all that. Um, huge shout out to Oliver for that. And um, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, dealing with my demo fails, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that's, speaking that's... of, uh, I can see like Oliver has also posted like how you should scroll. Um, 
in the chat. So, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, he, he's helping us like all the time. Yeah. Thanks, Oliver. Um, we're going to, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what key combination I do next is, I don't know what's going to do. So I'm going to actually pass it back over to Jonas. <laughs> and, hey. uh, but I really appreciate everybody uh, offering your help with, with how to zoom in on that. And, uh, yeah, so back to you, Jonas. Yeah. I'll figure out how to share my screen. Okay. So it's demo time. Uh, that was a, oh yeah, here we go. Um, so we also want to show real quick, like, um, some of the stuff that we are adding in, in Bloodhound Enterprise for, for these things. Um, and for all of the abusable edges that we are adding, uh, we will add a, a new finding. So if you have run in surprise, you, you don't have to, to look for these escalations uh, manually. You'll be able to see if there's a non-tier zero principle that is possible that has the, the rights to, to perform, for example, an escalation one um, attack. So you can see in this screenshot here, authenticated users and domain users has uh, they have the privileges to to perform escalation one. And with the new um, findings, you will also have new uh, remediation guidance. And the remediation guidance will be a slightly different from from the existing ones um, because there are so many con conditions that needs to be met in order for these like ADCS attack paths to to exist. So that also leaves up like a lot of opportunity for uh, remediating, but it's not like everything that's in scope for, for like breaking the attack path that's actually relevant for the remediation. For example, you're likely not going to delete your root CA. That would break, break the, the attack path, but that will also probably break your entire environment. So we're trying to, to like guide the, the user of Bloodhound Enterprise to, to think about like, how can I understand my environment better and, and use that understanding to figure out like what is the, the most appropriate solution to, to fix the, the environment and, and yeah, get rid of the attack path without breaking the environment. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We also, yeah, have a lot of people that we want to, to, to thank for, for all the work that they have done. And yeah, a lot of research and a lot of like tooling that has been shared with the community. Um, and we are super thankful for that because it is, it is very difficult to understand everything in, in ADCS. Uh, so we, we're so happy that there's so much, so many resources out there that can help us. Um, yeah, actually understand what's going on and, and yeah, understand all the different attack paths that have been like published so far. So a huge thank thank you to to all these people and and also to all the people that have, we have probably forgot to to include in, in in this slide here. And that's the that's the last slide, and we have like two minutes left. Yeah, we can if we need to go over. I think for time we can answer questions. I'm gonna go ahead and try to clear out some of the ones that we're talking about how to zoom in um <laughs> yeah actually let's see if i can oh here we go this is quicker yeah thank you thank you everybody for um for helping out with with how to zoom in there and for bearing with me Oh, so here's a here's a good question. So this says, how common is a scenario of an enterprise CA which is not in the NT auth store? That's a great question. Um, I think where you're typically going to see that most often is in like a multi-tier PKI infrastructure where somebody has followed what is commonly accepted best practice, which is to have an offline root CA intermediate CAs and then issuing CAs. So that will create at least a three tier PKI infrastructure. And not every CA in that chain needs to be trusted for NT authentication in order for the system to function correctly. So we have seen in real environments where maybe somebody creates a PKI admins group, but those users are not necessarily tier zero. They're not the same people who are domain admins. 
and that PKI uh, management group, they may have full control of the PKI services container, which will then inherit down to the NT auth store object. So that can create that opportunity there. Um, it's also likely that there's going to be third-party applications that grant their own service accounts uh, control of these different objects. Um, so it's hard to answer how how common that is, you know, like really empirically right now. Um, but that's one of the things that we're going to keep track of over time and see if we can come up with some good patterns that, you know, here's how this happens typically, or here's what we're seeing typically and, and help, uh, help guide people towards like finding those things that are common as far as uh, those misconfigurations go. Really good question. Yeah. Uh, but I think like in, in general, like, uh, I think our impression is that like historically ADCS had, has been configured uh, in a way that makes things work, um, like with with like granting too many permissions to too many principles uh, in in general, um, without thinking of of the consequences. So, like, I haven't seen like a ton of ADCS uh, in environments yet, in like real production environments. But I think like all the ones that I've seen, then all the enterprise CAs has been been trusted for NT authentication. So I would be, I would be like, I wouldn't be surprised to see an environment where it's, they have like an enterprise CA that's not trusted for authentication, but I think it's like, you can almost expect that that is the case that they will be trusted. Mm -hmm. um, I think one example that uh, we saw recently was what one person that posted in the Bloodhound gang Slack that we have. Um, um, whether it's like um, a, a blog post or not, like not a blog post, but uh, some guidance on how you can configure uh, Microsoft Scrum, like um, system, what's it called? Like it's then for like system monitoring sure. something. Um, S yeah. System center operations manager. That's right. <laughs> That's what it's named for. Um, how you can s set up like certificate authentication for, for that. And and their guidance actually suggested that you created a, a, a certificate template that would be vulnerable for uh, escalation one, um, and yeah. granting enrollment permissions to authenticated users, uh, which which is really wild because that will like allow any user in the environment to to yeah compromise the entire forest, um, and I think that is really a sign that. There wasn't like a lot of people that thought about like all the consequences of of these settings uh, a while back. Um, so, yeah, I assume that many organizations have like trusted all the enterprise uh, CAs for authentication without even thinking about whether or not they need it. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. This says, uh, "How is Andy running Certify on Windows? Isn't it a Linux slash uh, Python tool?" Uh, Certify is written in Python. Uh, I'm running Certify in Windows because I installed Python on that Windows machine. Uh, I'm not really a Python person, so the way that I did that is probably not the right way. Um, if you're looking for guidance, you know, from like a pen test perspective on on the best way to get Python tools running in Windows, I'm probably not the best person to ask, uh, just because I try to stick with PowerShell the best. Uh, scripting and programming language ever conceived by humankind, and uh, so yeah, that's that's how I was running uh, Certify on Windows because I installed Python um, on that VM. Uh, this question says, if the Escalation One Cert template gets removed from the CA templates after I already got the certificate as DA based on that template, will the DC still validate the PFX when I use it? for requesting the TGT. I'm pretty sure that it will because I think when I think when you're doing that TGT request I believe the DC is only validating the authenticity of the certif certificate as far as it being signed by a a CA that chains up to a root CA and it probably also checks to make sure, well, it, it does, it, it checks to make sure that the CA that issued the cert is trusted for NT authentication. I don't believe it checks if the cert template 
used to issue this cert is still published. I don't I don't think the cert template is necessary at all after that point. I don't um, I don't think either. Um yeah. the only thing that I'm I'm I wouldn't think that is the case, but like it the right way would probably also be to like to revoke all the certificates that has been created with this certificate template. Like if you're trying at least with you're trying to remediate risk. Um yeah. but I don't think that happens automatically because that could also break something. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it should still work. Um, and also, yeah, if, if the DA changed their password or something, then it should still work. Yeah. Here's another, here's a good question. It says, what is the percentage data size increase from Sharpound, assuming that every computer in the domain has at least one cert issued? So the data... The data increase size for Sharpound is not going to increase that much. Um, we're not collecting issued certificates. So even if every computer in the domain has an issued cert, that's not going to affect the uh, the size of the JSON objects that Sharpound produces. Now, that could change in the future. There may be a good reason for us in the future to start collecting issued certificates. Uh, I think it'd be really cool if we, if we were able to. And that that would increase the size of the Sharpound payload probably pretty significantly. But at yeah. least in the near term, it's not going to increase in size uh, materially. It, it won't increase very much. Uh, this says, any timeline when these new escalations will be in the latest release? So Jonas, can you do me a favor? Can you ask, um, can you ask Justin if if he's comfortable with us talking about the, those dates real quick while I answer yep. the next question. Yeah. So the next question is, can Waldo repeat the thing about PowerShell? Yes, I can very happily repeat what I said about PowerShell. It is the best, most effective, most elegant, most uh, most amazing uh, programming language of all time. Nothing will ever be better. Uh, I'm a huge PowerShell fanboy. And uh, yeah, I love PowerShell. I like it a lot. So uh, that question regarding uh, timelines, we're going to try to get an answer on that. If anybody else has any other questions, uh, we're this is the last question we have. So please feel free to put any other questions in the Zoom Q&A feature. Um, yeah. Did he respond to you yet, Jonas? Nope. OK. Um, Says Python is greater than PowerShell. We'll have to agree to disagree. <laughs> thanks, Jeff. For, thanks for for attending, Jesse. Um, we'll wait a couple minutes and see if we can get an answer as far as you know comfort level with with talking about that, you know that timeline. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for attending. Thank you for choosing to spend the last you know hour with us. Um. We know people are really busy these days. Uh, here, here's a question that says, if I'm understanding if an organization is vulnerable to the templates, the best way to remediate is by revoking the templates. This is a really good question. Is, is basically like, what is the best way for an org to remediate any one of these findings? The Unfortunately, the answer for that in almost every single instance is going to be it depends. Um, the combination of factors that have to fall in line for these things to emerge for a, a, an organization to be vulnerable to this is such that there could be a dozen different configurations that could be a remediation point. So you could unpublish the template from the CA and that could be effective. You could change a particular property on the template, and that could be effective. You could revoke the CA from being trusted for NT authentication, and that could be effective. So there's there's going to be a pretty short list of you know what's going to be most common as far as effective and non-disruptive remediation goes. But as far as what the best way to remediate, that's going to be on a case by case basis. And our intent is to put all the information into Bloodhound 
so that when you're analyzing this for your employer, for your customer, for whoever it is that you're looking at this for, that you can come to the best conclusion for that particular client, for their use case, for that template, whatever it, whatever it is. So it's going to depend. Uh, this says, if the template is adjusted, certs are not automatically revoked or reissued. That's my understanding. So certificates that were issued when a template was in, let's say, a vulnerable state, after the template is adjusted, those issued certs won't be automatically revoked or reissued. You would have to do that manually. Um, and that certainly could be part of a remediation strategy. Uh, this says, um, oh, go ahead, Jonas. Yes. Yeah, um, so I just got a message from, from Steven um, saying that uh, we'll also say that the first uh, release is early access targeting uh, January. Um, and we also have to mention that it's an ongoing effort. So we will not have like every escalation path in there from, um, from the start. But um, yeah, the first one where you can and see a lot of what we have been working on uh, will be released um, as early access in, in January. Yeah. Uh, this person asks, is the presentation being recorded? Yes, it is. And you can watch the recording uh, using the same link that you used to register for the webinar. Uh, this person says PowerShell for the win. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. And um... I should also uh, quickly say that yeah, uh, release notes and uh, announcements will be in the Bloodhound gang Slack. So if you're in that chat, then you can you can yeah, you'll be updated uh, when we make a new release and uh, what's in the release. Uh, this note says, a note on the NT Auth Store: any enterprise CA when set up automatically adds itself into the NT Auth Store. And a concerted effort needs to be taken every time to clean that up if it is not required. That's that's in my experience as well, is if I'm using the ADCS wizard in order to add a CA um, or bootstrap uh, the PKI infrastructure or whatever, that CA is always added to the NT auth store. Uh, so that's been my experience as well. This question says, which ESC techniques will be stopped? if strong certificate binding enforcement is set to two. Off the top of my head, I don't know, but it's at least going to affect escalation nine or 10. Uh, I believe like as, as the way that we will implement nine and 10. So like nine and 10 has changed a bit since uh, Oliver first um, uh, made his, his uh, blog post describing these two escalation paths um, because there was like this patch that changed some things. Um, and it has since then also changed um, the meaning of, of one of these registry keys. So strong certificate binding enforcement is for Kerberos authentication. And first there was like um, a disabled mode which was uh, when, it, when it was set to, to zero, um, that doesn't work anymore. So now it will be treated as it was in compatibility mode, which is when it's set to one. Um, but yeah, uh, long story short. Um, so I think the way that we, we plan to implement escalation nine and 10 is that uh, nine will be only for, uh, Kerberos authentication and, uh, 10 will be for S channel authentication. And for this one to be relevant, it's, it's going to be, yeah, it'll be the version nine and, if you set this this one to, to two, then you will break um, escalation nine. It will also break um, one of the versions of escalation six. So escalation six has to, no, that's, that's actually not true. I think escalation six is only, that will only be possible. No, actually, yeah, there's also, it could also be possible to perform escalation six um, if uh, a certificate template has this uh, no security extension flag um, and this registry key here is set to, to, to one to the capability mode, then yeah, you can perform escalation six. Um, if you set it to two, then it's not possible. Uh, 
and there's a couple of other questions here. Uh, yeah, Olaf is asking. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead with Olaf's question. Yeah. Yeah. So Olaf is asking: Will the SSM paths and others be possible to be implemented in these compound sets with the non-traversal edges? Yes. Um, it is likely that some of these more complex attack paths that we will explore for the, in the future will we will use like these compound or this this concept of like introducing some non-traversal uh, edges that we will use in order to to build yeah these abusable edges um, and I believe for SSGM um, that. We'll probably also need to to have some some yeah some non-traversal edges for for that as well, uh, but good question. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, again, thank you very much for choosing to spend your time with us. The recording will be available. Uh, yeah, it's beer o'clock in Europe. Um, so thank you very much. And we will see you in the Bloodhound Gang Slack, and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you very much.